Jerry Baker has served as editor-in-chief of the Wall Street Journal and managing editor of Dow Jones since January 1, 2013. Prior to taking on those, that, these roles, he served as deputy editor-in-chief for both newswires. Before launching his career as a journalist, Jerry actually worked in the financial sector, first as an analyst at the Bank of England and then as an economist at Lloyds Bank in London. In 1988, he started at the BBC as a producer and economics correspondent for TV and radio. Later, he moved to the Financial Times where he became chief U.S. commentator and associate ed editor. Jerry then took on the role of U.S. editor and assistant editor to the Times of London, where he wrote news and commentary and oversaw U.S. coverage for, for both the print and the online editions. Given his varied background his current, and his current role, Jerry is uniquely positioned to provide keen insights from a global perspective, and we look forward to hearing more. So please join me in welcoming Jerry Baker. Well, thank you very much, uh, Liz. Thank you for that very, very kind introduction. Thank you uh, to the Economic Club for inviting me. It's a real pleasure to be among such uh, distinguished guests, such distinguished figures in the Chicago community. I'm struck by looking at the screens that uh, I see shortly you're going to be hearing from uh, President Obama. So I'm uh, particularly humbled to be here and to be, uh, to be in such company. Uh, not to mention Larry Fink, of course, too. I'm sure will be equally uh, interesting and stimulating. Um, and it's lovely to be in Chicago. It's always great to be here. Uh, I know people uh, complain sometimes about the weather, but I'm a Londoner, so we, don't, uh, we, uh, we get used to it. Um, before I just make a few brief remarks, and then I think we're going to have a question and answer session, uh, just a little bit, as, as you heard Liz say about me, I was actually, I'm, as you, and you might be able to tell from my accent, uh, that I'm not actually from around here, as it were. I'm actually from, I grew up in London, uh, although I have lived in the States now for almost uh, 25 years, um, and I have five American, wonderful American daughters. I'm very happy, and we love being here, um, and I've become... Very, uh, very proud of uh, being an immigrant in this country, and as many, many immigrants to this country uh, indeed have been. Uh, but I am often asked when I speak to very distinguished audiences uh, like yourselves, people I can tell, people sometimes a little bit puzzled. They hear my accent and, accent and they see that I'm the editor of the Wall Street Journal. I'm actually, I'm actually the first Englishman to edit the Wall Street Journal, and I think there's a little bit of puzzlement as to how on earth did an Englishman end up uh, running America's most important and best News organization, I think <laughs> the, uh, the view often is, you know, I thought we dealt with you guys 240 years ago and <laughs> somehow you keep, keep, keep coming back. And the, the best way I can illustrate it, I think, is just to tell a little joke that uh, the British always like to uh, tell about themselves. I like to tell about ourselves, about how the British have uh, famously, in the words of uh, one Secretary of State a long time ago, British lost an empire and failed to find a role. But I think they still, too many British, too many of my fellow uh, English, English men and women still have a sort of slightly elevated opinion about themselves and about how important they are, despite the fact that the country is no longer uh, the top nation in the world, long way from it. There's still a sort of sense that people want to hear from the English a little bit more than is probably justified. And anyway, the joke goes like this. One day, God calls down from heaven. He calls on President Trump, President Xi Jinping of China, and I think she's still the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom, uh, Therese, Therese as, as we speak. To, to, Theresa May, and he calls them up to heaven and he says, I've got very important news for you. The world is going to end tomorrow and you've got to go back and tell your people that they've got to get ready for it. So President Trump goes back, goes on national television and says to the American people, I've got good news and bad news. The good news is there is a God and we religious, God-fearing Americans have been right about that all along. The bad news is I've met him and he's told me the world's going to end tomorrow and we've got to get ready for it. President Xi goes back to Beijing, goes on national television and says, I've got bad news and frankly, even worse news. The bad news, there is a God, and we, atheist, communist, Chinese, have been wrong about that all along. Um, and the worst news is, he's, I've met him and he's told me the world's gonna end tomorrow and we've gotta get ready for it. The Prime Minister of Britain goes back, goes on national television and says to her people, great news, God considers me to be one of the three most important people in the world. <laughs> so, I ho hope that gives you a, uh, a, a small sense of uh, why we think like we do. I'm going to speak just, as I said, briefly. Um, I, you know, this, the media is a very hot topic these days. Um, we have a president who uh, 
follows the media, has this rather curious habit of following the media obsessively and at the same time uh, flaying them with every available uh, device, usually Twitter. Uh, the media has been very controversial in the course of the last couple of years. Um, there are lots of things we can talk about. Um, I'm not going to talk directly in my remarks. I'm, I'm sure there'll be questions about the role of the media, and I'm happy to address them. But journalists do like talking a bit too much about themselves. So for a change, I thought just in my introductory 10 or 15 minutes or so, I wanted to talk about one of the issues that's very much on my mind, one of the, one of the great privileges of my job, and I, I really am extraordinarily fortunate and blessed to have this job, is that I, I get to talk to and listen to, more importantly, um, so many people around this country uh, and also around the world and get a sense of what is happening, what's changing, what, is, what are the big trends that are driving uh, world history. I've always been uh, fascinated by history. I studied economics, uh, but particularly with a focus on economic history for a long time. Um, and it's great as a journalist, uh, and my colleagues who are journalists here uh, will, will know that, to have this tremendous opportunity to have a kind of a ringside seat at these big events of history. And so I thought I would give you one particular, I wanted to address one particular topic that I think has been, I think is probably the single most important broad macro, political, economic, uh, strategic trend developing, I think, over the last decade or so. It has its roots further back. And it's very important. It's driving so much of the politics of our time, driving so much of the economic uh, relations of our time, of international policy and foreign relations too. And I think it will be the defining feature. And, it, and how we handle it and how we um, as a nation and as a world and as leaders in business and politics, how we handle it will, I think, be critical. It's, the stakes are this high. I think will be critical to determine whether or not we can continue to enjoy peace and prosperity. And the issue is the rise of nationalism. Um, and uh, a political phenomenon, a broad phenomenon that is the resurgence of something that I think we thought we'd seen largely dispatched to history uh, maybe 20, 30, 40 years ago. But nationalism is really very much back in vogue. And I know everybody thinks about, think about this, and we think obviously about Donald Trump. And again, we, I'll talk a little bit uh, specifically about President Trump. And President Trump, of course, ran, you know, ran on a very much a platform of economic nationalism and political nationalism, make America great again, his inaugural address about putting, uh, putting America first. Very much the, tr the, the um, political forces that propelled him to power, I think, were rooted in uh, a revival for a lot of people of nationalism, of economic and political nationalism. And of course, we saw Brexit, the uh, Brexit vote um, 18 months ago in the UK, which took many people by surprise. I have to say, it didn't take me by surprise, even though I haven't lived in the UK for 25 years. Um, knowing the way in which political opinion in Britain has been trending over that time, uh, it wasn't surprising to me that the British people decided to, by a small majority, but nonetheless by a clear majority, to reassert their national sovereignty and take themselves out of, vote to take themselves out of a, a, an international organization that was becoming increasingly a, a, a continental super state. That was very much an expression of this rising nationalism. But everybody's familiar with Trump and Brexit, spoke, spoken, people seem to speak about it all the time, is in the newspapers all the time. But it's also important to remember that it's not just the United States and the UK that are experiencing this right now. Um, again, you can look across continental Europe. Now, we've had several important elections in continental Europe this year, uh, Germany and France, uh, Austria, the Netherlands. Now, as you know, obviously, in both Germany and France, uh, sort of mainstream, traditional, pro-European, internationalist candidates won, Emmanuel Macron, obviously, in France, and uh, Angela Merkel in Germany. But it, I think this was, while there was a lot of, a lot of people sort of in the international community breathed a sigh of relief at their victories, I think that ignored something really important, which is in both those countries, yes, it's true the nationalists didn't win, we didn't get openly nationalist governments in Germany and France, but the support for nationalist parties, anti, largely anti-immigrant, um, strongly national, uh, strongly um, parties that strongly emphasize the national interest was stronger than it's ever been in either of those countries. And of course, those countries have a baleful history of nationalism uh, in the 20th century. And very much part of the impetus behind the European Union has been putting that history behind them. And what you're seeing instead is a resurgence of national sentiment within those countries in the EU. Uh, the National Front in France really, though, came nowhere close to winning the election, got an extraordinary share of the vote, and got, close to 30, got over a third of the vote uh, in the second round.
ground, which is a huge amount for a party that is overtly nationalist, in many ways, actually in some ways quite racist. Um, it did extraordinarily well in Germany, a country obviously which is racked by its own history of nationalism and has done its level best for 75 years to uh, essentially to expel nationalist politics. The right-wing party, the alternative for Germany, did extraordinarily well, got 12 to over 12% over of the vote. Other parties, too, that are kind of represent populism uh, did well there. That's a, that's a, instead of sitting back and saying, oh, well, they didn't win, the important thing is not what the, the overall outcome in terms of the numbers, but we need to look at the trend. And the trend in those countries is very much in favor of asserting national sovereignty and national interest. It happened you know, in Austria, where the, actually the Nationalist Party more or less you know, pretty well did win the election. Uh, you're seeing it elsewhere too in other parts of Eastern Europe. The former Soviet Union, countries like Hungary and Poland, they've, they've elected nationalist governments, strongly nationalist governments. The Czech Republic, Czechia, uh, the same thing. So you're seeing this rise of nationalism in the West, but even more importantly, and again, this does get overlooked, you're also seeing a nationalist sentiment and nationalist leaderships beyond, beyond the West, beyond what we think of as the West, but beyond North America uh, and Europe. Look at China, most obviously. Xi Jinping, uh, just, just starting his second five-year term, is the most aggressively and assertively nationalist leader that China has had um, since the Communist Revolution. I don't think there's any question about that. At his uh, People's Congress uh, just a few weeks ago, he made a very important speech, a really pivotal speech in terms of Chinese political history, which for the first time for a Chinese leader asserted China's national um, standing and national sovereignty and its assertion of national, its national rights on the international stage about taking on a larger international role for itself. That's a sign of this resurgent nationalism. In Japan, you have a government, uh, Shinzo Abe, uh, also just had an election and got re-elected. Japan, obviously, like Germany, a country with a very troubled history of nationalism. Now, Shinzo Abe is not a, is not a, is not a fascist, is not in the uh, mold of the, uh, the Japanese fascists of the 1930s, but he is a, he's the most nationalist leader that Japan has had since the Second World War. He asserts Japan's national sovereignty, wants to change the constitution <coughs> so that Japan can operate much more like a normal nation with a normal military. He has taken on China, uh, a country with whom the, Japan has obviously long-standing historical differences. Korea, South Korea, uh, same thing again. This is a nationalist government that you have in Japan. And one more I'll add, too, is India. Uh, India, this sometimes gets overlooked, too, but India, uh, under Narendra Modi, the Prime Minister of India, who was elected a couple of years ago, he stands for a lot of things, economic reform and for changes to the way India works. He also stands for a very, very strong identity with Hindu nationalism, India, the, the idea that Hinduism uh, is tied up with the very notion of India and Indo India as a state and the assertion of Indian nationalism in its relations with its neighbors and its broader relations in the world. And you can look again, you can look elsewhere. We, we, you can look at the Philippines where you have a nationalist leader. You can look at some of these other countries too. This is something that is, I think, truly the most important political trend, geopolitical trend of my lifetime. How did it come about? It's interesting because we've seen, essentially over the last 40 years, we have seen the explosion of what people have called globalization, globalism. Uh, the extraordinary uh, prosperity as well that's been achieved for many people, not all, but for many people, by the growth of trade, the growth of capital flows, human uh, migration too, very large uh, migratory patterns. The biggest explosion of globalization since before the First World War. It began really, you can take, pick your starting point, but it probably began really in, with the Nixon shock, uh, 1971, the US essentially going off the gold standard, the um, removal of those uh, kind of capital controls, if you like, the free floating dollar. But then almost every major historical event then over the next 25, 30 years had the effect of increasing global integration, increasing globalization, whether it was crucially very important political developments in the US and the UK, the election of Margaret Thatcher in 1979 in Britain, who was a strongly pro-free market internationalist, as well as, by the way, having strong uh, political uh, nationalist sentiments, very much in favor of 
pulling, pulling down barriers, allowing global free trade, allowing business to spread itself around the world, strongly deregulatory. Same with Ronald Reagan, uh, obviously elected in 1980 here. Then, of course, through the 1980s, you had the collapse of the Berlin Wall and the emergence of Eastern Europe into the, ultimately into the Europe, most of those countries into the European Union and the growth there of international um, co collaboration uh, and the growth of international trade. Of course, the collapse of the Soviet Union itself in 1991, which brought Russia into the global system in a way that it hadn't been under the Soviet Union. And of course, most important of all, through all this period, really, really, really getting underway properly in the 1980s, the emergence of China into the global system. China, uh, which up until, up until really Deng Xiaoping, up until the late 1970s, had been very much a closed, um, really very much a poor, very poor subsistence economy, undertook massive economic reforms at home, opened up its economy, became one of the world's largest uh, suppliers uh, to, uh, to manufacturing, beginning in the 80s and 90s opened up and became a huge player on the international stage economically. And again, all this movement towards global integration, towards openness, towards pulling down national barriers was accompanied by very important political and strategic and diplomatic decisions. Uh, you had obviously the creation of NAFTA uh, in, in the United States in the early 1990s uh, and the um, in effect elimination of trade barriers and a lot of goods uh, in North America. Very important development which helped undoubtedly help lift Mexico, um, Mexico's economy significantly. The creation of the WTO that, which succeeded the former, the GATT, which also opened up trade more broadly around the world. So this process from the 1970s onwards right through to the early 2000s was a process of almost continuous globalization, integration of the global economy, pulling down barriers, enabling goods, capital, and again, to a large extent, people. Uh, within the European Union, that was particularly true, people to move freely across borders. So you had this explosion of globalism, if you like. Now, I think what happened is a couple of things. Firstly, um, it became increasingly clear that while that global integration, expansion of trade and capital movements and capital flows was having a net benefit for the global economy as a whole, I don't think anybody could possibly doubt that. You just look at the numbers about what happened to global GDP growth, especially after China uh, emerged into the global economy in the, properly in the 1990s, there's been a massive expansion of the rate of global GDP. Um, but of course, the benefits of that were fed were were spread uh, in a very, uh, very, very poorly distributed way. Um, while China uh, and many of the emerging markets in Southeast Asia, in particular, and increasingly in Africa, have taken advantage of global integration, obviously low, largely low wage economies to compete with the high wage economies. They've done extremely well. Uh, that many hundreds of millions of people have been lifted out of poverty in those countries in the last 20 years. Obviously, those effects weren't necessarily all positive for countries that were opened up, uh, that were facing, if you like, this, this new competition, the United States, Western Europe in particular. Uh, and that led to not only the um, kind of economic outcomes that you've heard so much about and that people talk so much about, but I think also rising political resistance too. And what you saw, and I think what was, what was exacerbating it was globalization, the phenomenon of globalization and global integration produced really very much um, not only an uneven distribution of winners and losers geographically, but actually produced uneven distribution of winners and losers within countries. So if you were a well-educated uh, American um, with access to you know, high, good, good education, with access to capital, uh, with good prospects, being able to work in the knowledge economy increasingly, then you were a beneficiary of globalization. Uh, you really were, and you've seen astonishing growth. And by the way, the financial sector, uh, 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 an accompanying phenomenon has been the explosion of the financial sector between the 1980s and about 2008, uh, also contributed to this. So you saw the financial sector in the major industrial, what we used to call industrial economies, benefiting enormously from this, and people who had access to that and were uh, participants in that were enormous beneficiaries, but the rest of the country were getting left behind. And what was happening was that more and more people uh, were, more and more people in the, if you like, in what are called, what's called the elite, were identifying more and more with the globalization, more and more with the opportunities of the world that was presented to them, and less and less to the interests of their own fellow Americans, Brits, French, Austrians, Germans, or whatever. So you saw this, not only this 
lack of opportunity and you know, famous uh, number that people would know about is that medium wages in the United States, for example, went nowhere between 2000 and 2015, literally, literally didn't increase at all. So you saw this, not only the relative immiseration of significant numbers of Americans and Europeans, but you saw at the same time happening massive expansion of the wealth of the wealthiest. So this extraordinary growth of inequality. Now that was bound to create serious political tensions. A situation where, I mean, quite literally, people in you know, New York, the, the, the sort of elite, if you like, in New York City, have more in common with their counterparts in London than they have with their fellow Americans in uh, Ohio or much of um, uh, Illinois or Wisconsin. You've got this global elites benefiting from global integration, increasingly distanced from, and increasingly, I think, alienating the people in their own country. So that was a critical driver of resentment, domestic political resentment. Um, and I think you see that, you saw that as part of, that's part of the reason for Brexit. It's part of the reason for Donald Trump, a large part of the reason for Donald Trump. And that is, by the way, that gap continues to grow um, because we don't yet know what this what the expressions of this political nationalism and this economic nationalism will actually amount to in terms of policy, although we're getting some idea, we don't know how that's going to evolve. What we can say is that the gap between the beneficiaries of globalization and the losers is actually getting larger still, and that is going to continue to put enormous political pressure on the system. Another factor that clearly, I think, led to um, uh, the rise of nationalism and this resentment at the way the international uh, system was operating um, was, if you like, a kind of cultural alienation too. There's, a, there's a, the, the gaps between the lifestyles of um, the, if you like, the elite in countries like the US, the UK, much of Western Europe, and most of the people in those countries is enormous and growing. Not just in economic terms, but in cultural and political terms too. Whether it is in terms of, and you could, there are good data on this, um, you know, observance of religion or attitudes towards things like gay marriage or towards these big social changes that have occurred in the last 20, 30 years, there is a huge gulf now between, if you like, the kind of urban, global, internationally minded elite uh, and much of the rest of the country. That's also created among the populations, majority populations in most of those countries, I think a sense of, uh, a sense of alienation and resentment and led to this strong desire to express once again and to reassert the idea that there is such a thing and such an important thing as the nation. And then thirdly, obviously, we've had security concerns too. And I think the rise of Islamist terrorism uh, in the world over the last 20 years has heightened security fears. Now, this is a complex issue, and it's obviously being handled by demagogic politicians in predictable ways. But there's no denying, I think, that the events of September the 11th, 2001, changed the way in which not just Americans, but actually many people in the rest of the world view the idea of their own national security, of international cooperation, and indeed of the relations between, between nations. This, whenever you get a period where there, is heightened secure, where there are heightened security fears, you do get people tending to cling to um, completely understandably, the idea that we should have borders, we need to reimpose borders. This is a big phenomenon in Europe, as you probably know, anybody who's been in Europe in the last couple of years, with these major terrorist attacks in France uh, and in Germany, um, there has been, particularly in France, as you know, those countries, with the core countries of the European Union operate without any border controls at all, uh, and that's created tremendous, the, the, the terrorist attacks created a tremendous fears and a tremendous backlash against that. Um, and so there's a strong pressure to reintroduce national boundaries, to reintroduce, um, uh, to reintroduce the idea of national sovereignty uh, in order to protect the country's citizens uh, from the security risks. So that's, I think, broadly where we are, why we've got this rising national. There are other factors too, individual factors, a rising China, uh, which um, we, we, we don't need to go into, but rising China, the way in which Japan has changed over the last uh, 25 years too, and the economic challenges that Japan has faced. But the common thing in all this is a widespread, much, much, much wider spread, much stronger desire on the part of populations uh, around the world to assert the very idea of national identity, of national sovereignty. Uh, and you're seeing it even on a smaller basis. You see it in Catalonia or in Scotland, where countries actually, where individuals want to be, want to reestablish, if you like, a stronger sense of identity with their own country. 
Um, I'm going to wrap up quickly, but wh where will it lead? We write, as I said earlier, we, we, we don't really know yet. We don't know what the practical implications of the Trump presidency, for example, really are in this field. Obviously, in terms of economic relations, President Trump has threatened to tear up the NAFTA agreement. Um, and, you know, that remains a distinct possibility. He's obviously pulled the U.S. out of the uh, Trans-Pacific Partnership uh, negotiations that were going on, although the other 11 countries have just announced that they'll go ahead. He's expressed a strong desire for American jobs to be repatriated to the United States. Um, and we'll see whether he's able to achieve any of those things. He may be able to, and certainly he may be able to achieve something about radical with NAFTA, but we don't know yet. Same, similarly in the UK, we don't quite know how Brexit's going to work out. So far, it hasn't handled, been handled very well. But I do, I, I am concerned that if it's not handled properly, then the kind of nationalism that we're seeing, that we've seen rising in the last decade, could end up with much greater tension between nations. We're already having to, the biggest challenge for the world in the 21st century, in the first half of the 21st century, let's say at least, is very likely to be how does the world handle the emergence of China? Um, you'll have heard this you know, many, many times. Historians talk about these are the great moments of peril in history when um, one, the, the power, one dominant power as of now, like the United States, that power is challenged by a rising power. How does, the, how does the United States, how does that dominant power handle the emergence of the new power? We just don't know. So far, it's been handled peaceably, but we just don't know uh, how that's going to unfold. So I think we are entering a period of danger. Uh, I think we're likely to see these tensions rise. I think there are opportunities here. I think, I think the key thing is going to be to address the... the understandable grievances and resentments of large numbers of people in these developed countries that feel that they've been left behind by globalization. I think to dismiss that, as some people are intended to do, as, you know, basket of deplorables or people who are racist or xenophobic, or some of them are, no doubt, but they, many of them have genuine concerns about what's happening to them, to their jobs, to their livelihoods, to their families, especially in this country, but also in much of the Western, uh, of Western Europe. And I think addressing those concerns with real measures, improving, to, to, to improve their opportunities, to give them better access to the kind of uh, prosperity that, is in, that many people have enjoyed in the last 20 years is critical. And I do think that making sure that the world, econ that, that the world system, that the United States remains engaged in the world system, the, the United States is the greatest force, I believe, for peace and stability in the world, and has been for, for 100 years. And and I think making sure the US is, remains engaged is absolutely going to be critical too. So I think those are the uh, immediate challenges that uh, governments here and in much of the West face. And I think they, uh, they understand that and they're starting to address them. But it's clearly going to be a bumpy ride. And just to conclude, I started off with a reference to um, uh, a, British, uh, a British Prime Minister, Theresa May. And I'll conclude by quoting my favorite uh, British Prime Minister Winston Churchill, I think everybody's favorite Prime Minister, uh, Winston Churchill, um, who uh, famously said, and it's, you know, so much of this does come down to decisions made in this country. America is still the dominant country in the world system. Um, and he's once supposed to have said, I'm sure as you've, you've, heard, you've heard this before, but he's once supposed to have said, um, the great thing about America is that America always does the right thing, but only after it's exhausted every other alternative. <laughs> Thank you very much. So um, let's start with, with globalization and build on what you, what you were just sharing with us. When we look at that, you highlight the risk of increasing tensions across countries. Um, I'd like to talk a little bit about economic risk. Mm. So we're at a time where we see markets uh, performing well. We expect the, the bull market to continue. There's this perception that nationalism perhaps creates economic prosperity. Can you share your, your view on that? It's an interesting, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a good point there, because despite the concerns that clearly a lot of people have about the possibility that we may be entering, we may be ending this long phase of global integration, which has obviously been hugely beneficial for financial markets. You know, you've seen an astonishing run up in the value of financial assets during this period. Despite concerns about that, and despite concerns about trade and what Trump or Brexit might mean, um, you've seen an, an astonishingly good year for financial markets, right? Since, since Donald Trump was elected just over a year ago, you know, the S&P 500 is up about 25. Last time I looked yesterday, it was about 25, 26% in a year. Um, business confidence is higher than it's been in a decade. Consum consumer confidence is um, at its highest level for 17 years. So you've got this interesting conundrum that while there are concerns about nationalism, economic nationalism, I think there's a stronger optimism right now about, particularly about the measures that the 
Trump administration is expected to take. You know, obviously, uh, tax, tax reform, if we get that through, and that's very much a hot topic right now in the next month, that's what everybody will be talking about. And if you, a big reduction in corporate tax would clearly be, you know, we can argue about how the benefits of that would be distributed, uh, but it would clearly be beneficial for shareholders. So there's a lot of confidence about that. The Trump administration, despite the, let's be blunt, pretty rocky and variable performance in lots and lots of ways, has almost quietly and not with a huge amount of fanfare, been rolling back regulations left, right, and center. Now, again, you can argue about the pros and cons of that, but in the areas of energy, uh, of uh, financial, uh, the financial sector, uh, labor, labor law, um, health to some extent, this administration has been aggressive about rolling back regulations, and businesses feel very good about that, feel very optimistic about that. So you've got these odd cross currents of concerns about you know, is he going to pull out a NAFTA? Uh, is he going to get us into a war with North Korea? God help us. At the same time as quite a long, strong level of opt... And by the way, plus other concerns about just when will he stop tweeting and what's going to happen with, <laughs> we'll the, get Mueller, there. with the Mueller investigation and all that stuff. But at the, so alongside those concerns, and in fact currently outweighed, at least in economic terms, you've got this optimism about the possibility of tax, lower taxes, about the reality of uh, deregulation. And I should say one other thing too, of course, which is very important, the world economy right now is very strong. I mean, Europe has finally emerged from a decade of stagnation, growing by its standards very strongly. Uh, the US has had two quarters of 3% growth, may get a third quarter uh, in this current quarter, which will be the first time that's happened in a long time. Um, China has emerged from some of its the questions about, about its economy and is doing well. Emerging markets have emerged from the sort of collapse in commodity prices in the last few years to do quite well. So you've got, you know, as the governor of the Bank of England put it a couple of weeks ago, the world economy is firing on sort of 11 of its 12 pistons. Mm -hmm. So you've got this unusual synchronous global growth coupled with this optimism about what this administration will do here, at least on the business agenda. And that, I think, is outweighing these concerns that people have about, uh, about assertive nationalism. So let's touch on a few places across the globe a little more specifically. I'll take an, a question from the audience. Thank you for submitting them. How do you think Canada and Mexico view our current uh, US, NAFTA negotiations? Well, this is, I was just talking uh, to Bruce, the former um, US ambassador to Canada, uh, about this over lunch, and it had some very interesting insights into it. Um, I don't think they're viewing it with happiness. I think that's the first thing to say. Um, I think, so what, and I, I, we just, I just came here from our Wall Street Journal holds our annual CEO council with 150 CEOs, senior members of the administration. We had Mike Pence and Steve Mnuchin and Gary Cohn and Wilbur Ross and a bunch of others, and I had a lot of conversations with them, and particularly on, so on, on NAFTA. I think one of the concerns is no one quite knows how this is going to go. Is this, what people are trying to figure out is, is Trump's tweeting and posturing about NAFTA saying, you know, he doesn't think we're going to get a deal and so he's prepared to pull out. Is that just classic art of a, the art of the deal, Donald Trump? In other words, you go to the maximum position, you say, right, I'm going to tear up this agreement and you force them to give big concessions, which is obviously what the US is trying to do. Uh, and you end up with a deal that he can then sell to America and say, I've reformed NAFTA and everything's going to be great. Or is it real? I mean, is, is, is it going to, uh, is, is it, does he really intend to pull out? And the other question is, do the Canadians and the Mexicans, are they willing to give the kind of concessions to make if it is the first, if it is a deal, uh, a deal making exercise, are they willing to make the kind of concessions? The impression I get from speaking to Canadians and Mexicans just in the last week or so is probably not. And I think one of the dangers is, firstly on Canada's side, um, Canada already does have an existing uh, free trade arrangement, free trade agreement with the US, which could be, you know, it may, it's not clear how it would work, but it could just be resuscitated in the event of uh, decline of NAFTA. So the stakes are not necessarily that huge. I mean, they're big. I don't want yeah. to belittle them, but, but it's not the end of the world for Canada. Secondly, Canada is exploring uh, closer relationships with the rest of the world, particularly China. And China here sees this as an opportunity, I'm sure. On the Mexican side, I think the real worry is that the current direction of politics in Mexico is strongly headed in favor of this very, very radical uh, Lopez Obrador, the, the, the opposition candidate. There are going to be elections in a year or so um, who could win there. And that is, you know, he's been compared, I'm, not for me to say, but he's been compared to Hugo Chavez. So the US pushing 
hard on NAFTA on Mexico and demanding concessions from the Mexicans might work, but it could have really, really worrying political implications and it could end up with a very hostile government uh, on the border, outside NAFTA, uh, able to do all kinds of mischief. So, and again, by the way, and, and if Lopez Obrador were to win, it would be another example of this, na of this nationalist sentiment. And, and that's what's so interesting about it, because as one country expresses it, its nationalism, other countries are inclined to say, you know what, yes, we're going to take a national stand too. So I think, I don't know. I, I don't know how these national... And the thing with Donald Trump is you never know. You know, there is a, there's an unpredictability about him, which can be good, you know, if you're on the other side of a negotiating table, I, can, I suppose, but it can also be terrifying. Um, and we just, I don't think we quite know how that's going to work. Speaking of which, let's go across the globe to mm. North Korea. Yeah. And, and talk a little bit about, um, you know, the inconsistency, the, the lack of clarity. Mm. We're guessing, is this, you know, is this a miscalculation on the globe's part, perhaps, of what, the, you know, what might happen with North Korea? And it, or is this just gamesmanship and we'll see if we get to the negotiating table ever? Again, I mean, obviously, I don't know. But I, I did have a very interesting conversation this week with some former uh, people who negotiated with the North Koreans actually over indirectly for the US government in the 1990s uh, under the Clinton administration when they reached agreement. And again, others who were there uh, trend, sort of discussing with the Chinese in particular the, uh, in, in, the, in the early 2000s under the Bush administration. My sense is that for all the posturing and the tweeting and the, you know, fifth grade insults being traded at the moment between the two of one's old and the other's short and fat. I mean, really, I mean, my children, I think my, my, my youngest is 13. I think she's beyond that stage. I was going to say fifth grade is generous. Beyond, beyond that stage of uh, human interaction. So it's a little disturbing, I agree. But beyond all that, if you can just sort of cut through all that sort of verbiage, I think there is a, I think there is a strong prospect of, a, of some kind of a deal. I think the Chinese are putting more pressure, and to be fair to Trump, I think one success he's had is he has, by simply by scaring everybody, I think he has pushed the Chinese to be a little more aggressive with North Korea. In the end, for all the, what's said about North Korea and about what a crazy place it is, I don't actually think they are suicidal, and they know that if they were to launch a nuclear missile at Japan or at the United States or one of the United States territories, that country will be dust, you know, with, 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 within hours, and he knows that. And I, I don't, you know, I, I, in the end, that sort of mutual assured destruction, or in his case, not mutual assured destruction, individual assured destruction, is probably going to hold them back. What, what they seem to want is they seem to want some kind of a deal whereby the U.S. significantly de-escalates its own military presence and standing in South Korea. And I think that is something that both the North Koreans and obviously the Chinese would very much welcome. Of course, it's not something the South Koreans or the Japanese want. No. But I suspect that some kind of a deal whereby there is a significant scaling back of North Korea's nuclear program in exchange for some fairly significant concessions by the US is there to be done. I'm pretty sanguine. I think, you know, I, th and I could be wrong, but I think that the there is the, in the end, the motivation there on both sides to get something done. Well, we'll, hold, we'll all hope you're right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, before we leave globalization, uh, you, you've, you're a, you've been a student of economics and of history, and we know the pendulum swings, we know there are cycles. Mm. Do you think this wave, uh, this moment we're in in, in, ter in terms of nationalism is part of that? Will the pendulum swing back? How long will it take? Where might it land? I don't see it, I really don't see it swimming back soon. I think, I think in Europe it's going to increase. Again, I think there's a huge level of complacency among the European elite in the wake of the Macron and Merkel uh, elections in France and Germany this year. There is huge resentment among Europeans about the way in which the European Union is run and how remote it is from its citizens and the way in which European... Look, the, the, the reality of the European Union is the European leadership is essentially trying to abolish national boundaries. And most, rightly or wrongly, most Europeans don't want to do that. They still, they're still French, or they're still German, or they're still Dutch, or obviously British. Um, and they are resent, res, and they're resentful of that, and I'm afraid to say there's no evidence whatsoever that the leadership of the, of the Europeans has understood that. In fact, they're taking the, the kind of mess that is unfolding over Brexit as kind of vindication of where they want to go. And I think that's a huge mistake. So I think, I think it's going to continue to advance in Europe. 
we'll see, you know, in the US, it's, it's again, it, the, the danger, I think, and the way in which it could escalate and where it would, could get quite ugly is, and the Mexico example is a, is, is a powerful one, if American nationalism creates a backlash, uh, if you can call it that, or creates a reaction in Mexico to a more extreme nationalism um, in Mexico, the, 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 you know, th this is a... This is, a, this is a vicious circle, really. And other countries could do the same thing, that the more the United States asserts its, but I'm not saying it has any, shouldn't do it, it has every perfect right to, but the more the US asserts that national um, independence, uh, the more other countries will do the same, and that will force maybe the US to do more. You could see a dangerous, you know, the, the, the history of the last, since, since the nation states really started to emerge in the 17th century, the, ten, the right nationalism has been a source of tremendous tension, and the chances that that will not be the case this time, I think, are pretty small. Well, since we've established it's all about us, let's come back to the U.S. Then, yes. <laughs> at this moment of nationalism, we've had several questions on tax reform, so I'd love to touch on that. Um, what's your perspective on, and is there support for tax reform, and also, um, does it make the U.S. more competitive? So I think it's, it's very hard to say. So we've, again, I just got back from our CEO council in Washington where we had 150 CEOs. While I interviewed, um, we, well, I interviewed Gary Cohn, the National Economic Council director, and we, are, we polled the room, the, the CEOs in the room, to ask them, will there be tax reform? Uh, will it get passed by, Jan by January 1? And a majority said no. I was quite surprised. There were 57% were, were pessimistic, said no. Um, and then interestingly, we also asked them in a more informal show of hands whether or not the reduction in the, the big reduction in the corporate rate of tax would lead to them increasing their investment. And only a few hands in the room went up. Now, that didn't surprise me as much because I think historically speaking, despite the claims that are made for it, and there's all kinds of good reasons to cut taxes, don't get me wrong, but I think the idea that businesses are going to Businesses are sitting on a huge amount of cash right now, a huge amount of cash. They are not really short of investment funds. What they seem to be short of is investment opportunities. Mm -hmm. And that's probably the result of slow growth. Now, if the economy can grow faster, and I think with deregulation and probably some other tax reform, that will create more opportunities. But the idea that the business tax cut itself is going to lift investment and therefore employment, which is very much the administration's argument, I think is, I think is open to doubt on whether it makes the US more competitive, I think clearly, you know, the US has the highest corporate tax rate in the world. We all know that, 35%. It will help there, and it will certainly help in terms they'll, they'll, they'll get something to enable businesses to repatriate a lot of their funds, which they can't right now because of the nature of the tax system. Um, but of course, as, as people point out, even though the official cor corporate tax rate is 35%, the effective current tax rate paid by businesses on the whole is about 18%. So that will come down, obviously, with a lower corporate tax rate. That will clearly make the US more competitive, I'm sure of that. But I think it will also bring more, and it will bring some investment into the United States. I've no doubt about that. There will be, be some investment. So there clearly be some benefits, but I think the benefits are being overstated. As to whether or not it will happen, you know, it's really, it's, 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 the, it's so complicated. On the one hand, there is an urgent desire on the part of Republicans in the House and the Senate to get something done. I mean, the attempt to a, a repeal Obamacare was a political disaster for them. And if they, they don't want to get to the end of the year without doing something, so just something that they can stick the label tax reform on, I think there's a, char a good chance that'll get passed. But what will have to be jettisoned in the process as we go through the next few weeks is hard to say. I mean, there's a lot of opposition to the state and local tax deduction. Uh, elimination in the House or capping in the House. They've now introduced the Obamacare mandate and the repeal of that, which is going to upset some in the Senate. So there's going to be an awful lot of horse trading. I suspect, again, the political imperative is such that they do want to get something passed into the president's desk. Whether it's by January 1, there I'm more skeptical. It still feels like early innings is what yes. you're saying at yes, this point. Very much so, so there are those who would say that um, tax reform as it's been proposed would perpetuate income inequality, you talked about this gap and the impact of that gap that you know somebody in New York might be better connected to somebody in uh, the UK, yeah. in London. Um, what, what do you, what's your view on that? And I mean, I, I, how I look, the, an the administration's argument is that the, A, there's a big corporate tax cut, which will amount to whatever you estimate you like, but around a trillion, somewhat over a trillion dollars over 10 years. And that, that will encourage companies to invest in jobs, uh, good jobs, good domestic U.S. jobs that will produce, you know, strong wages, and that will help uh, itself alone 
to uh, lift wages and to eliminate some of the, uh, some of, to reduce some of the inequality. I mean, again, I think, I think there, are, there are reasons to be skeptical about that. One, as I said earlier, will, will it really create that many jobs? I don't know. Two, the US is pretty well close to what economists think of as a full employment already. I mean, we, the unemployment rate is 4.1%. Now, there's some issues about participation rate and whether or not you know, there are still people out there who are not part of a measured labor force, and so will they, they've, there may be a further to go. But we're not, the, the US is not short of, the US is not, um, it, it does not have massive oversupply of labor right now. And you haven't seen a big increase in wages yet. You might do, I think you might see that. So, so I'm skeptical that, 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 the, um, that the idea that you're gonna, either that you'll create a huge number of jobs or that you know, even the, a, a stimulus of that sort right now is absolutely necessary uh, and will be effective in terms of increasing jobs because, job, because jobs are pretty, for most workers, jobs are pretty plentiful right now. So, I'm, so I'm, we'll see, and then on the personal tax side, you know, it's it's a wash overall. Meaning, you know, the, the middle class taxpayer will see a bit of a reduction. Some wealthy people will see a bit of an increase, but some wealthy people, especially through the estate tax, will see a massive increase in in their wealth. And obviously, they tend to be shareholders. They're going to benefit probably significantly from the cuts in corp corporate tax. So, I don't I don't know. The, the administration makes the case that it will lift wages and help inequality, I think that there's plenty of evidence to suggest that that could be outweighed by the other effects. Well, being the banker playing the reporter today, I get to have a little bit of fun here. Um, I'll ask the, if you had a crystal ball kind of question here. Uh, look at this administration, look at where Trump you know, has been leading thus far. Project out four years. Um, we talk about will there be a two-party system and where will Trump land in that spectrum? If there is, or if there isn't. Wow, that's uh, yes. Forecasting. I said it was going to be a fun forecasting for Forecasting what is happening next <laughs> week is hard enough, let alone four years' time. I mean, it's um, it really is. You're absolutely right. I mean, this is a turbulent time, and we're seeing the Republican Party kind of being torn apart, largely because of Trump or Bannon. Look, you know, look at the, the sort of dreadful spectacle that's unfolding in Alabama right now, which I know is very much you know to do with you know the individual case there. But you're seeing. There is no, you know, the, the, the Trump, the, I, I, both the, the strength and the weakness of Trump is that he, he doesn't, he's, he's not really a Republican, right? I mean, we all know that, and people knew him in New York, he was never a Republican, he only decided to become a Republican relatively recently. Um, he doesn't really share a lot of the core Republican values that have animated people like Mitch McConnell and Paul Ryan, and going back even further than that, you know, to you know Bob Dole and, and others, and he's not he's not been a, he's not a Republican in the traditional sense at all. So that's I say both the strength and the weakness. He came in, he appealed to a lot of people who are not Republican voters in states like Ohio and Michigan and Pennsylvania and Wisconsin states that he won that no Republican had won, not Ohio but Michigan, Wisconsin, and Pennsylvania, no Republican had won for a long time by getting former Democratic voters, many of whom, by the way, voted for Barack Obama twice. Mm -hmm. So he has that appeal, he has that ability to reach way beyond party lines, but at the same time, the party itself is dividing really sharply into a sort of Trump, Trumpian party, and a, um, and it's not exactly never Trump, but it's but it's but it's the more traditional Republican Party, and and where that's going to lead, we don't know. The next year's congressional elections will be critical because we'll see whether sort of Trump or Steve Bannon, if you like, supported candidates do better than more traditional mainstream Republicans, and that will give us some clues to where the Republican Party is going after that. And then on the other side, on the Democratic side, you know they're pretty divided too. You saw that election campaign, and we're seeing more revelations coming out about the Hillary Clinton campaign. Um, you know that was a divided Democrat. Party, and it still seems to be pretty divided between those like Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren, who want a much more radical, much more uh, you know redistributionist approach, if you like, to, uh, to, to 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 democratic politics, against those who, in the sort of former Clinton camp, still think the way to win is by being moderate and, by the way, appealing to those especially white working class voters that the Democrats lost mm -hmm. so badly last year and, and that, that were responsible for electing Trump. So there's going to be tension there too and that will play out over the course of the next year. So, uh, you know, again, I certainly wouldn't make predictions, but I think that, look, I think it's very hard for a third party to get any traction in this country. Ross Perot was the closest we came in the last 50 years, you know, in the 1990s. Um, it's really hard for all kinds of institutional and financial and you know political reasons to get a third part a third party to really gain. But I think you're going to see a lot of um, 
you're going to see a lot of tension within the existing parties and a lot of temptation for someone else to come in and maybe see if they can take advantage of it. Let's talk a little bit about the uh, business of news. So define fake news for us, if you would. Did that phenomenon start with Donald Trump? Will it end with him? What Absolutely happens? Absolutely not. I mean, it's, so fake news has been around for a long time. It's become called fake news and has a specific uh, understanding right now. But look, pe people have put around false stories for their own benefits, either financial benefit or political benefit or whatever, for as long as we've had a printing press. I mean, mm. quite literally. And they probably did it before that by word of mouth, only we don't have the record of it. So you can go back and look at this and whether it was, by the way, the Wall Street Journal was founded in 128 years ago. And it was founded in large part because Mr. Dow and Mr. Jones and another man called Bergstresser, who sadly never quite gets the, uh, the uh, <laughs> never quite gets the eponymous recognition. It's all Dow and Jones, but the three men back in eighteen in the eighteen eighties founded the Wall Street Journal because they were so unhappy with the quality of information that was out there, which was so unreliable. It was made up, it was gossip, it was rumors, it was fake news. And so they said to their readers on that very first day of publication, all those years ago, you know, this is, we're gonna tell you the news straight, we're gonna give you facts, and we're not going to, you know, give you stories that are largely made up. So it's been around fake news, you know, and then you had the yellow press, uh, famously, you know, over 100 years ago. Um, making up stories to, uh, you know, to advance an agenda. So it's not new. Obviously, what's new about it and why we're talking about it so much is because the ease of spreading it on social media. Um, so, you know, the classic fake news story from the 2016 election campaign is probably still that one that claimed that Hillary Clinton's allies were running a pedophile ring out of a pizza <laughs> restaurant in Washington, D.C. I kid you not. Um, and this got, you know, it was, it literally, it was literally invented by somebody. It appeared, you know, everybody who has social media, but it's a Facebook news feed. It appears on your news feed. People can see it. And, you know, because of the way it appears in the news feed, you, and unless you know that it's, a rely, that it's not a reliable source, it looks like, it looks on your Facebook news feed just like a Wall Street Journal story or a New York Times story or, um, you know, a Chicago Tribune story or whatever. So, that was the classic example, and there's an element to which obviously Russia was, I think this Russia stuff is a little bit overblown in my view, but clearly Russia was involved in helping, you know, and Russian bots, as they call them, were involved in, in helping it. It was clearly a factor, but there were many, many, many people trying to promote, using social media to promote falsehood in the interests of advancing one side or the other, many of them, uh, you know, supporting, supporting Donald Trump. So, so it's become a huge problem um, because, again, because, because social media is so ubiquitous and the information that people get from social media, they tend to rely on, especially if it's sent to them by their friends, mm -hmm. which is how much of social media stuff is circulated. So it's a challenge. Look, the, and, the, and Facebook in particular, to a lesser extent, Google and the others, you know, with YouTube, um, but other companies have got to do something. Have got to, are trying to address it, um, but I don't. I, it's always going to be out there. I think the answer is to try, is to, for us to for, for 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 mainstream, reliable, I believe, news organisations like the Wall Street Journal to stick to what we do to emphasise how we go about reporting and why our reporting is so is reliable because. It's a lot of hard work goes into it. It's not, you know, you don't just wake up one morning and publish a story and put it on Facebook. A lot of work goes into understanding. We have rigorous fact checking and rigorous standards and ethics editors who make sure that stories conform to the right standard, the highest possible standards of reporting. And I'm very proud of that. We do that. We work very, very hard to do that. And I think, look, I think this is, this is a horrible time and you're seeing a lot of this fake news and partisanship in news, which is terrible. People don't trust one news organization because yeah. they think it's politically partisan. In many cases, they're right, but they don't trust it. Um, and so you've got to, to reestablish trust. I think you've just got to make sure that you are demonstrating the kind of work that goes into reporting the facts. And you've got to be fair. I and mean, I do think a lot of the media right now is not being fair, one side or the other. I think they've abandoned the idea of objectivity and fairness and are just either going after Donald Trump or defending him, you know, absurdly. And I think, you know, we've got to try to restore a sense of objectivity. And that's very much what I consider my role to be. Last question. You run a very large global organization. Um, you're managing through a time of tremendous change, transition. In the summer, you announced a, a very significant reorganization. Uh, tell me a little bit about how you're managing through that change, that transformation. 
what are the most important parts of, of the, the reorg you announced? And then what is it going to take to be leading a news organization 10 years from now? So, in, I mean, in a, I won't bore you with every memo As that I sent out over the last... <laughs> Uh, years. My colleague Joe Chung, our, our Chicago bureau chief, is here, and she knows um, uh, as much about this as I do. But um, so I won't go through all the details, every last detail of the reorganisation. But it was really about for us. Uh, this affects every organisation. Every organisation is, exactly. is being disrupted by the digital revolution, and it affects news as much as anybody. And we are obviously, you know, again, in very brief, simplistic terms, our business model has been upended, right? We used to be dependent on advertising, largely. 80% um, of the revenues of newspapers were advertising up until 15, 20 years ago. Obviously, along came the digital age, and along came Google and Facebook in particular. And that's where people understandably wanted to advertise. Huge audiences, targeted advertising. So advertising has just dried up for most of the traditional media, particularly print, ad print advertising. This forced us to be to, to seek an alternative business model, and for us that alternative business model is subscription base. We'd always had subscriptions, a significant subscription base, and in 1996 when the web started, the very wise people at the Wall Street Journal decided they, people should pay for digital subscriptions, for, for digital access. So we've always had that, but we've doubled down on that in the last five years. And the mm -hmm. good news is we're growing dramatically. We've, we're, the Wall Street Journal circulation is higher than it's ever been. We're going to hit probably uh, two and a half million subscribers at some point in the next year or so. We are growing, and we've put on a huge number of subscribers in the last couple of years. But we had to change. We're an organization of about 1,300 journalists. Um, we had to change the way we, we have, you know, we've been evolving up until now very well and we've made a lot of progress but I felt very strongly that we needed to go do more than evolve we had to do something dramatic and transformation I, I described it as being you know like over the last five years or so since I've been editor you know it's been like having a lovely old stately home and you keep making improvements to it and you keep you know fixing the floors and fixing the ceilings and whatever but the underlying the, you know the foundations are steadily weakening and you just have to say you know what we've got to have to sort of start again so that was the aim it was a real attempt to think like a you know, I said is what we needed to do is this disruption is so dramatic and the challenges we face in the digital age are so large that we have to try to do our best. To th We're, this is an organization that's been around 128 years. We have to stop thinking like an organization that's been around that long and is constantly adapting. And we have to sort of strip everything down and say, if we were starting a business news organization today in 2017, what would our organization look like? Mm. And so we just, we did literally, you know, all of the major roles and functions in the newsroom were either abolished um, or, radically or radically changed. We just went through everything we do, all our workflows, all our processes, all our people, all our structures globally and said, you know, is this, would we be doing this if we were starting from scratch today? And if not, we need to get rid of it, and what would we replace it with? So it was, you know, it, it's, uh, you know, there are many wiser heads in business in this audience than, than mine here. It's hard to do that. It's really hard for a legacy organization to do that. But I think what we were trying to do was get ourselves into the mindset of saying, this is such a big challenge. It's such a crucial uh, challenge and an opportunity for us, but we're only going to be able to survive and ultimately really thrive in this environment if we start from scratch, if we think about starting from scratch. Well, thank you. On behalf of all of my fellow members, thank you very much.